So in our discussion of atomic theory, we got to go back. And I mean way back. We got to go back to the ancient Greeks. And we talk about a guy named Democritus who said, you know what? I don't think, like everybody else right now, I, a lot of people thought at the time, a lot of deep thinkers thought that matter was in, infinitely divisible. You could just take, take a, like a table and you divide it in half and quarters and then eighths and then you keep going down, down, down. You could do that with matter forever. Democritus said, I don't think so. I think that there's a fundamental unit when we get down to a real base level, can't see it, uh, can't even do experiments on it right now, and they couldn't really, but he just thought that there was a fundamental unit, an atomos atom. Yeah. So Democritus, Democritus is credited with really coming up with that, with that idea uh, way back when. And then, you know, we get, we get uh, time moving on sort of thing, and we get a lot of uh, alchemy happening in the Dark Ages. That's a lot of good chemistry that happened, even though it was kind of weird because they were just trying to find how to turn out elements into gold. But a lot of great science came out of that. But then we get into a little bit of an Enlightenment period. And uh, after the Renaissance, we get some really great experimenters, like Lavoisier, for instance, who said, hey, you know what? I see that, that uh, matter or mass is completely conserved in chemical reactions. He did some very elegant uh, little experiments to be able to show that. And so we came up with, and he came up with, a law of conservation of mass. And we know that in thermodynamics, the first law of thermodynamics talks about conservation of energy. We've got mass and energy. And, and you know what though, um, way back when, it was thought that those two were pretty distinct from each other. You know, you got matter and you know, oh, Matter could absorb energy and release energy, but they were two separate things. Uh, just wait, coming up to the 1900s, all the bets are off. But I digress. So we, 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 we come from Lavoisier and we get to a guy named John Dalton. Dalton, was pre he was a pretty smart guy. He's like a high school teacher too of sciences, which I think is pretty cool. Dalton comes up with his, th his theory and he says, well, you know what? I got a model of an atom. I got a construct for you. And I think an atom is just this thing. He really wasn't sure what it was, but he said, I do believe that the atoms actually exist. And, you know, when we actually have compounds, those are really atoms that are being put together in definite and distinct ratios with each other. And, and these things are conserved, too, in chemical reactions. That's awesome. And so Dalton's credited with that first model of the atom. Didn't have much in it, but that's his theory. Uh, so then we go from there and we, got, we say, well, okay, well, what's in the atom? Well, J.J. Thompson found out that there were some charged particles in there. And, and what his model of the atom was, was that you have a sphere of positive charge, and then you've got negatively charged kinds of things that are at random dispersed within the atom. That's called a plum pudding model or the raisin in a bun model because you don't know where the raisins are. Those negative charges, they're just in there somewhere. Okay, that's Thompson's model. And then we go from there and we say, well, all right, we've got positive and negative charges that are, that are inside of an atom. That's really cool. And then Rutherford finds out that, hey, you know what? Um, um, when I take my, do my little experiment uh, to be able to shoot alpha particles at a piece of gold foil, and, and that's really broken down. It's a very, very complicated type of a setup. But anyway, the point was that the alpha particles should have actually shot through the gold foil, but sometimes when he, when he detected alpha particles actually bouncing off, some of them came right back so to, to the thing that was shooting the alpha particles in the first place. Well, how is that possible? It should have been like a, like a, like a cannonball going through Kleenex. That's what an alpha particle should have done to the gold foil. But alpha particles, which have a certain charge on them, like a positive charge, must have been hitting something that was large enough with a positive charge inside the atom to be able to be deflected back. And ladies and gentlemen, guess what that is? That's the nucleus of the atom that has the protons in it. And so now we've got a positive charge sphere that, you know, we'll say is in the middle of the atom. We're not sure where it is. But then, where are these negative charges? Where are these electrons? Well, that constitutes a lot of research that had to happen afterwards to be able to figure out where those electrons were. But here's the thing. At about 1905, we thought we had it all figured out, you know, physically in terms of the atom. Matter is distinct uh, then from energy, and then along comes Einstein to mess everything up, and he says, uh-uh. He says, you know what? He says, I'm coming up with this. And? E equals mc squared. And what that means is that there's an interconvertibility between mass and energy. Matter and energy. And that means then that matter 
is actually another way of explaining energy and energy can actually have mass. That was really wild. And what that helps to do is to be able to, to identify what an electron is all about, how it behaves, and where it might be found.